Welcome to our master series, Creation of Medical Digital Images. This is the first presentation, which discusses the interaction of ionizing radiation with tissue and creating the data for images. The modalities used in medical imaging primarily produce digital images for analysis of anatomy, physiology, and pathology. The image to the left on this slide demonstrates how we would utilize a active matrix on a flat panel detector collimating to the area of interest and how the detectors would actually collect the intensities or the interactions between the tissue and the ionizing radiation so that we may be able to create digital images. The advantage of digital information is that each location and the nature of each digital level are known and can be adjusted. The operator of the modality or radiographer must select the parameters to acquire the data for the image requested. To do this, the first step is to select the proper examination, which reflects the part and position. Next, the radiographer would input any data or demographic data that needs to be shown on the image. Then the radiographer would collimate to the area of interest. We only want the detectors to detect what tissue interfaces are in the area that we are examining. If we over collimate, we lose data or we lose part of the image. If we do not call enough and collimate enough or under collimate, we get extraneous data to factor into our image parameters. And this can change somewhat the contrast of the image being displayed. Once we've acquired the image, we need to review the image before releasing it to the information system for the radiologist to pull the image up and interpret it. When we are analyzing the image prior to releasing it, we must know how to recover errors without repeating examinations for the modality that we are using. One of the things to look for primarily is the exposure index number or exposure factors set up by the manufacturer. These will indicate that you have acquired the data within the proper ranges to create the image. If the exposure factor is not correct, the image needs to be repeated. Although it may look good to you, it is still missing data. Select the appropriate factors for body habitus and size. You want to make sure that if you have a pediatric as opposed to a young adult, that the parameter you set reflects that it is a teenager and not a child. We also want to take a look at the body habitus of people that are large, obese, and also anorexic or small. We look at all of the different parameters to begin with we analyze a patient and then we set up a technique to try to capture the best data possible. Acquiring a digital image is a two-part process. The first is to collect data concerning the interaction of some form of radiation with the tissue in the area of interest. The next is to transform this data into an image or set of images using specific computational tools. The process of acquiring data to make a digital image is indirect and often counterintuitive. 
This means that we have a loss of visual clues to make adjustments. Next, we have a very wide dynamic range in digital imaging compared to analog or film screen imaging. So there are more shades of gray. We have to be more selective and more precise. In digital imaging, we have auto rescaling, which basically the computer takes the data that you have acquired and pre-processes it so that we'll, we're able to see an image on the monitor that we can analyze. Remember, there's not a lot of difference in atomic numbers and density. So what happens is the computer actually goes in, takes a look at the area that is collimated, takes that data from there, and then pre-processes it so that we get an image on the monitor that we can see. Once we take a look at the image on the monitor, we can post-process the image if needed to correct for minor errors or repeat the image. The relationship between radiographic factors and image appearance are decoupled in digital imaging. When we used film screen or the photographic process, there was a direct correlation between milliamperage and time or mass to the brightness and density control. There was also a direct relationship to KVP, kilovolts peak, to the contrast. The higher the KVP, the less contrast. The lower the KVP, the higher the contrast. This is not true in digital because we have computer algorithms set up that manipulate the data prior to showing it on our monitor. So it is imperative that the operator has a good grasp of how the modality works itself and the basics of the physics capturing the data. With film screen or analog images, there was a direct correlation between the exposure, the processing, and the image produced. Today, there is a change in the parameters that we use. In electronic imaging, the functional parts of conventional radiography have been separated. We have image capture. Next, we have image storage. And finally, we have image display. To give you an idea, there are three types of monitors. There are three, level mon three levels of monitor that are used for display. There is a diagnostic monitor. This is a very high resolution monitor that the radiologist uses to interpret the images. There is a QA monitor. This is the monitor that the operator or radiographer looks at and analyzes the quality of the image. And there is also a general monitor that is used at the different stations or on the floors for the doctors to look at the basic images. And these have the lowest resolution. A digital image is not an exact snapshot of reality. It is only a discrete approximation based upon the factors that we request to see. We collect data with our exposure. That exposure and data are stored. The data can be brought up many times and changed or post-processed to reveal different areas of interest. This keeps from having to re-expose the patient as we used to have to do with analog images or film screen. If we wanted to see a different contrast or we wanted to see a different area, we had to go back and re-expose the patient. With digital, we can take the data that we have stored and 
post-process it or process it in a different manner. Remnant radiation, or the data that is collected on the image receptor, allows us to create our images and the data that is collected is referred to as the latent image. It is a reflection of the thickness, atomic number of tissues, and their density differences. The contrast produced by an object depends upon the attenuation of the beam and the tissue the beam has interacted with. Let's take a look at the characteristics of a digital image. If you take a look to the right, we have a representation of an abdomen or a KUB that is superimposed over a matrix. A digital image is displayed as a combination of rows and columns known as a matrix. The smallest component of the matrix is the pixel, which is a contraction for pixel uh, picture element. The location of the pixel within the image matrix corresponds to an area within the patient or a volume of tissue referred to as a voxel. So when we're looking at the matrix, what we can see is we know the exact intensity is recorded and location of that intensity in rows and columns, which combine create an image. Let's take a moment to study this slide. We're looking at the interaction of ionizing radiation with tissue to create shades of gray those shades of gray will correspond to a matrix. At the bottom, we can see a matrix with different shades of gray. And the strength of the intensity for each of those shades of gray has a specific number, or it is digitized. As we see the patient interaction with x-ray or iodizing radiation, you'll note that there are three different types of interactions that occur. One is scatter. Scatter is the predominant interaction. The next is absorption. And the photons can be partially or completely absorbed as they travel through the body. And the last one is that the photon or the x-ray energy goes through the body without ever interacting at all. These intensities are recorded on an image receptor called an active matrix array for a flat panel digital receptor. The remnant radiation or the radiation that is actually picked up on the image receptor is less than 1% of the total amount of the primary beam. We are calculating the differences in density, which are very, very little. And we want to contrast these to give us shades of gray to create an image. Let's begin by looking at the construction of a flat panel x-ray image receptor. On the x-ray image receptor, we have a active matrix array, which stores the energies that are transmitted through the patient, the remnant radiation. This radiation is stored in a specific location that corresponds to the intensity of the x-ray beam at that location. If we go to see the energy capture, you can see that each one of the little cells or pixels on the image receptor 
store energy. And each one stores an energy that reflects or is corresponding to the energy that is captured at that specific point. Combining all of these energies and reading them out, we can create an image. So let's take a look over to our left and we see a digital x-ray room and above we see our flat panel array of intensities that have been recorded and these intensities are recorded as a digital number or a digital intensity. We then take this digital number and we can't read the numbers so we change it back to analog or visible light. So we actually change the shades of gray from numbers to the intensity reflected shades of gray on the monitor. And this is how we look at our images on the QA monitor at the modality. Let's take a look at the ionizing radiation as it interacts with the patient's tissue it is received on a flat panel image receptor. The primary beam, the radiation technique that we have selected, is an energy that interacts with the patient's tissues. The majority of this energy is dissipated in the tissue as heat. Approximately 99% is heat or less than 1% is the actual remnant radiation that forms the image. Of that 1%, approximately 0.5% interact to form the image. In other words, they're the characteristic or photoelectric effect. The rest is scatter radiation. And as we've discussed, scatter radiation gives us no information for our image creation. Only the photoelectric effect and characteristic radiation caused by absorption and partial absorption will give us the data we need or the intensities we need to create an image. Let's take a moment to look at the diagnostic x-ray equipment using ionizing radiation. We select the parameters or the technique for creating the primary beam of ionizing radiation, the exposure. The exposure is emitted from the x-ray tube and the energy, the ionizing radiation, interacts with the patient's tissues. It is either not absorbed, fully absorbed, or partially absorbed or scattered, Compton scattered, as it goes through the patient or the different methodologies of the interactions. We record the intensities of each of these interactions on an active matrix array, which means that their intensities have to be categorized. So we give them a number which represents their corresponding intensity. This is taking analog, which is the ionizing radiation, and turning it into digital on the active matrix array image receptor. We then take the data from that active image matrix array on the receptor and change it back to visible light or analog. And the visible light is the contrast and the shades of gray that we see that comprise the image. If we use a contrast media, we're adding an additional absorption factor within the patient and we have to use a exposure that is selected for that particular contrast media. Without the contrast media, we're looking at just regular tissue. Whereas we can see that if the 
radiation pass totally through, we just have air, which would be black. We have dark gray, which would be fat. We have a lighter gray, which would be soft tissues and muscles and water. And we have different shades of white, which show us the calcifications and the bone. The amount of absorption will give us the shades of gray there. We have totally white if we have an appliance, such as an orthopedic appliance, which is metallic in the patient. And this metallic appliance absorbs all of the radiation energy, and so it is totally white. This is how we get our contrast to form our image. So we're very simply mapping the intensities and changing those intensities to shades of gray through algorithms in the computer. Creating the exposure, which has to do with positioning and the milliampage for time or mass, the amount of energy we're using, ionizing radiation over a specific period of time, and we have what is called KVP, the ionizing photons that are emitted are emitted at a certain intensity or speed. The fastest they go is what we call KVP, kilovolts peak. That is the fastest that the photons can travel, but not all photons travel at that energy. In fact, most photons travel at a lesser energy, which when we average it out is about two thirds of what the KVP is. And this is called KEV. KEV is the average energy of the beam. Exposure selection is extremely important. If we collimate the primary beam too much, we cut off a portion of the area we want to visualize or we cut off the amount of data that can be seen. If we do not collimate, we get a lot of extraneous energy, which then can detract from the contrast in the energy that we're trying to look at, which comprises the tissues of interest. In creating ionizing radiation, we actually take electrons and shoot them across a, to a target. So we take electrons from the cathode, where we're burning the electrons off, and accelerate them across an area until they crash into or interact with the anode. This interaction creates photons of energy. The photons of energy are then transmitted down through the patient. This is the ionizing radiation. The ionizing radiation is absorbed as it goes through the patient, and we know that it's absorbed at about four centimeters. We get half of it absorbed for every four centimeters that we're traveling through. In addition to the amount of absorption just through the thickness, what we look at is the fact that we're going through different densities of tissue, from bone to fat to water. Each of those have a corresponding different atomic number. As the photons interact with the tissue, they are being absorbed scattered or partially absorbed. The majority of these will be totally absorbed and there will only be about less than 1% of the photons that are transmitted through the patient to create the remnant radiation. And the remnant radiation is what we use to make our image. Understanding the atomic number is essential in creating a technique. 
what we're looking at with the atomic number simply is what are the different elements that are comprising the tissues. The atomic number is assigned a number based on the number of protons in the nucleus. We also have a mass number, which is how tightly those are packed together. Therefore, when we take a look at helium, which has an atomic number of two, we only have a couple of protons and we can go through it fairly easy. Whereas if we took another element, say lead, which has a 86 atomic number, it is harder to penetrate lead. Lead absorbs more than helium. After understanding how this interaction works, let's go through this process on the next few slides. Protons and electrons comprise an atom. The number of protons gives us the atomic number as we discussed. We have different elements with different atomic numbers. If we take and combine these elements, we end up having a molecule. Molecules are specific combinations of atoms. Each of the atoms has a different atomic weight and therefore the molecules make up an element such as carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, all put together. And that is a molecule. The molecules combine to create a cell. As we're aware, cells combine to create tissues. And in the cells, the cells continually multiply and divide and die. This process is done through a plan or a map or an information guide known as DNA, which is in the nucleus of the atom. If an electron is ejected and it actually interacts with the nucleus of the atom and hits the DNA, it can have two types of damage to the DNA ladder. One would be a break in the strand and the other would be chemotoxic, chemotoxic damage. If this happens, the majority of the time, the cells will simply die or repair themselves. Very rarely will they mutate. The only mutations that we worry about are with high dose radiation and in low dose radiations under one sievert, we do not worry about any stochastic events such as cancer happening. So cells are continually replicating and dying off, which is how our body grows and how our body functions. The cells put together create tissue of cells create four types of tissue. We have connective tissue, epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. take a look at the human body. The human body is covered by the largest organ, which is our skin. So what we're looking at is what is contained within the skin? Well, what we can see here are there are multiple organs that are in the skin. 
All of them are functioning and created from different densities and combinations of molecules and cells. Putting all of these together, we end up with a system within our body. So we have the respiratory system or the cardiac system or the digestive system or the urinary tract system or the nervous system. All of these combine make up the human body and that is what we're studying is the human body and any changes to that human body that we can record that would explain the patient's condition or pathology. When we use ionizing radiation to determine the patient's status or analyze the patient's tissues, there is a very complex process that is initiated and it all begins with the radiographer choosing the right technique, the right algorithm, the right patient, the right region of interest, so on and so on. So what we're really looking at is to be able to correctly do a digital image of the body, the radiographer must expose and position the patient correctly to begin with. When we talk about using the primary beam or ionizing radiation, we're talking about the interaction of this radiation with the body. As the radiation interacts with the body, we have what's called the linear energy transfer function. What this tells us as the radiation goes deeper into the body, it gets less and less, and we talk about it being half value layers. So when we talk about about four centimeters, the radiation has dropped into about half of the original intensity. What happens when it's interacting with the tissues is either scatter radiation or the photoelectric effect with full or partial absorption. When we create our exposure, we use mass, which is the amount of radiation, and KVP, which is the penetrating speed or the penetration of the radiation. The higher the KVP, kilovolts peak, the more penetrating the radiation will be. So if we have a low energy KVP, the photon uses all of its energy and is truly absorbed or partially absorbed. If we have a higher energy KVP, we have less of the energy being absorbed, so we end up with more shades of gray. So low KVP is high contrast and high KVP is low contrast. So when we look at positive contrast media, bones and things with high atomic numbers, we're going to need a higher KVP to penetrate those areas. Image contrast is caused by the characteristic and Bremsstrong effects or the absorption related to a tissue's thickness and atomic numbers, meaning how easy it is to penetrate. Here we see a graph showing the K characteristic radiation and the Bromstrong radiation and how it relates to the intensity of the KVP, which is 100 KVP, and the KEV, which is the average energy of the beam. Characteristic radiation is what we use to create our images. Unfortunately, the majority of the radiation that we collect on our image receptor is scatter radiation or Compton scatter. Scatter radiation or Compton scatter is independent of the number atomic number of the tissue. The probability of Compton is the same for bone atoms and for soft tissue atoms. The probability of Compton is more dependent on the KVP or the X-ray energy. So what we find is that Compton scatter 
provides no useful information, only density. Both the scattered X-ray and Compton electron have enough energy to cause more ionization before losing all of their energy. In the end, the scattered photon is absorbed photoelectrically. Compton is just as likely to occur in soft tissue as with bone, and Compton is a significant portion of the remnant radiation. Remember, Compton is non-useful diagnostic information and only adds to density. So differential absorption is key to being able to get a quality examination. And differential absorption is based upon the atomic number of the atoms and the mass density. So it's how many of the electrons do we have in the atoms and how densely are they packed. Obviously, when you're talking about high density, you're talking like bone. When you're talking low density, you're talking soft tissue. To create contrast or tissue densities, we look at the photoelectric absorption properties of the tissue. This represents the anatomic structures with high X-ray absorption characteristics, such as bone, and lower characteristics of absorption, such as fat and tissue. The differences in contrast are what allow us to create an image. It should be obvious at this point in time that radiologic technology is an applied science. And not only is it a combination of a number of sciences like physics, anatomy, physiology, and information technology that the radiographer has to be able to apply to get the images for analysis. Because the modality does not have any storage on it for information, if we post-process any of the information and send it to storage for the radiologist to pull up to interpret, that is the original information that the radiologist has for interpretation. Any post-processing changes can affect the interpretation. In conclusion, let's put this all together. Are you missing pathology? Do you know your exposure index for your modality and what it should be? What we're looking at here is a uh, S number, which is with computed radiography, their index, and it should be 200. But you'll notice that the image we have has an S number of 40, but it looks really good because the computer has automatically compensated for our errors and it has changed the contrast to be what we would like to see. In reality, we take this same data and change the S number to 200 and we can see what we actually captured. Big difference. If you don't have enough information, like you've collimated off information, you're not going to get a good quality image. If you do not expose the image correctly, you're going to end up again with an image that looks nice with digital, but you may be missing pathology unless you know what the expected exposure is for that imaging modality. Thanks a lot, and we'll move on to our next module in just a few minutes. Thanks for watching this presentation. We look forward to you watching our next presentation in the Master Series, which will be about histograms and algorithms used for creating medical images.